Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of all these is love. So before we start, Crystal, let's have sure. a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that Crystal has been chosen to speak on your behalf, and we pray for your spirit to work mightily through her, that the words that she speaks will come directly from the throne of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so today I do have a topic that is actually quite um, maybe hard to swallow as well. Um, unfortunately, that um, lot has been put upon me. <laughs> uh, being a part of the women's ministry um, leadership team, um, I have, um, well, I have, I have to actually bring up things like domestic violence and you know abuse for of victims and um, I will also probably focus on maybe domestic violence within the church but also it's also outside the church but this is what I'll be talking about a bit more today so the content has been provided by uh, the women's ministry from the conference and I've just tailored it, put some spice in it, and I made it my own recipe f to tailor, to cater for this audience here as well. Um, so let's, let's start with um, the parable of the lost sheep and the shepherd's action. But otherwise, um, it's just sorry. Yeah. If I can. If I can invite you to open your Bibles in um, Matthew 18, 10 to 14. Thank you. All right, I think we are all there now. And I'm just going to read this. Take heed, I'm reading from the New King James Version. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, the angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray? Does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And, it, and if he should find it assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over the sheep, that sheep, that over the 99 that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So if we look at verse 11 and 12 it says for the son of man has come to save that which was lost and also in verse 12 you know the shepherd he leaves the 99 sheep to search for one lost sheep to search for that one lost sheep and the shepherd he joyful he joys uh, sorry joyfully celebrates when the lost sheep is found. I mean, wouldn't you want to be that one lost sheep as well? That you know that you have a father in heaven who sends his son to give you salvation. I mean, I wouldn't want to miss on that, but unfortunately, a lot of people will miss on that because there's a lot of misunderstanding about who Jesus is really. Sorry, I have already gone through that. Um, but also, let's actually, let's go to uh, read together as well, Luke 15, 1 to 7. This is still about the parable of the lost sheep. But if we look at... Um, I will read that as well because it's, got, it's, it's, it's the same story but just presented in a different way. 
Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him, and the Pharisees and scribes complained, com uh, complained saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. So here you are. Again, he's actually asking for us to rejoice with him for that one lost sheep. And it's... and. The remainder reads, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. I mean, who doesn't need repentance today? We all need repentance and we are also uh, in a broken world where sin is just ravaging this world and we are part of this world and we are part of the sinners. And thank God for that shepherd Jesus Christ to actually come and um, find us and look for us. I mean, if you, if we think about it as well, so what are the factors in church that can affect, um, you know, people, people leaving the church as well? And some of them, you know, they go through so much and uh, they feel like um, they are doing the best that they can do. But then when they come in church, they feel like there's a bit of a hypocrisy, you know. And uh, or there are conflicts, uh, broken relationships as well, and lack of support within the church. I mean, we can all feel a little bit like that, depending on what we are going through. So, and, and some of them, they still continue to attend, but they often feel neglected, lonely, and isolated um, in the personal struggles, and we all go through struggles. So this sense that they have either been forgotten by our community or by God, which is not necessarily true, because we don't really know what people go through sometimes, and they don't also uh, express it. So I suppose what we need to do is to just not to have that kind of judgment when we come to dealing with people who are going through any sort of abuse or traumas as well. So but what do you think also maybe caused the, the sheep to be lost, to become lost? Um, did they fall behind or they wandered off or lose sight of the others or find itself una unable to keep up. So just imagine how these sheep's feelings of being isolated and alone and separated from the community of the other 99. Let's read, um, let's see how the shepherds can lack. There's that lack of proper care from the shepherds for the flock as well. In Ezekiel 34, three to four, um, there's a bit of a reproach of the irresponsible shepherds of Israel. I mean, just before what Andrew was, um, Andrew, Andrew Furch was talking about, and what are we giving to God? What are we keeping for ourselves? And how is the shepherds shepherding as well his flock? So let's look at Ezekiel 34, 3 to 4. You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So this can definitely 
affect, you know, we, we have a role in the church of supporting abuse victims as well. And uh, we have to let them know that Jesus cares um, about them. And um, that's where we come in place as well. Um, the shepherd is to seek people to help find the lost as well. And um, strengthen them when they are weak. Uh, bind them up if they are broken and support the wounded. Um, there is a book called How People Grow um, from two doctors, so Henry Cloud and John Townsend, and it emphasizes the importance of community, community and personal growth. Uh, as a personal experience, when I am going through um, just difficulties and challenges in life, I have a group of women where I can, um, I don't know, I talk to and they support me, they don't judge me. And even the men as well here, I mean, just having a really great relationship as well with the men and you can, you feel like you can talk to them, you can talk about anything. And um, I think this is just a great community to be within a church community. And we need to make the people who are abused as well feel like the church is a community who cares for them. Um, yes. And um, it's not just within the church, of course, um, but there are you know, examples of domestic um, violence, abuse victim, like a woman sharing her experience of, of domestic abuse, or a family coping with the trauma of sexual abuse, or a young person confronting the reality of having been groomed, or another big victim being molested at a church event. I mean, we've heard many stories about all these things. And um, sometimes, but also God's plan for our development is always to involve others. So we are needed to help those lost sheep and heal them and make them feel connected to the church community. But silence as well or indifference can uh, leave individuals feeling like there's no safety within the church family. And um, they may not choose to disclose abuse due to the attitude of others, but while serving in the church as well, abusers may continue to harm others within the church if their actions are not addressed. And victim, they often feel disillusioned by the church and alienated from God with nowhere to find safety. And the church should be a sanctuary, providing refuge from life challenges. And it's, it's a place also to learn uh, about the good shepherd and the experience that, you know, to experience his protective care, as well as to receive support and compassion from one another. Um, if we open Romans 12, 10, and 15, it encourages each and every one, you know, showing to show affection and support to one another. So Romans 12, 10 and 15. Sorry. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another. Rejoice with those, that's uh, verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. So it's not me who's actually asking for it, it's actually God and Jesus within the Bible asking for all these things. Um, I want to actually have two pit stops today, so it's just to stop, reflect, and recalibrate on what we've um, just discussed, and just to see uh, just different perspective on, um, first of all, uh, you know, what is, uh, what is domestic violence, and also where is our, our faith in the Lord um, 
to help out the lost sheep. So, what is domestic violence? It refers to a pattern of abusive behavior in any relationship that is used by one partner to gain or maintain power and control over another. It can be physical, emotional, sexual, or financial abuse. It affects people of all genders, ages, and backgrounds. And it occurs in both married and unmarried relationships. And it's also a violation of human rights and has serious consequences for victims and their families, unfortunately. So the statistics as well um, is about one in three women worldwide experiencing physical or sexual violence, mostly by intimate partners. And the church has the opportunity to provide support to these women. And um, so also we will be distributing this end it now little handout and you will have some resources at the back there if you know of anyone who needs, um, you know, to, to call a helpline or needs support uh, within the church or outside of the church. Um, so we're just going to be handing them out now. Uh, if you know of anyone, please provide that to them because it's very important. I mean, I think most of us are pretty lucky that we don't have to go through things like that. Or, you know, we go through other traumas in our lives, but I wouldn't want to be the victim of, you know, of that. Um, or anyone, or kids as well, you know, being abused. So we've got some types of domestic violence. So you, we've got the physical abuse. So inflicting physical harm or injury through actions such as hitting, kicking, and choking. And we've got the emotional abuse, manipulating, controlling, or humiliating the victim through constant criticism, threats, or intimidation. I think we know a lot of people uh, do that. Unfortunately, the world has actually become like that as well. And we've got the sexual abuse, forcing or coercing the victim to engage in sexual acts without consent, financial abuse, controlling or withholding money and resources from the victim, making them economically dependent. And we've got also digital abuse. So through con context, you know, text, constant texting or social media monitoring, like stalking, harassing, so. And what are the consequences of health effects of abuse? Abuse can lead to physical, mental, sexual, and reproductive health issues. It can result in depression, depression post-traumatic stress, anxiety, disorders, and other health problems. And abuse during pregnancy increases the risk of miscarriage, stillbirth, and low birth weight babies. And of course, health effects include headaches, chronic pain, gastrointestinal disorders and limited mobility as well. Um, and you can actually also see that where, um, you know, if you see bruises, fractures, or like burns on victims, um, and if they start isolating from friends and family, or, uh, you know, fear, con you know, constantly walking on eggshells and feeling just powerless but also there's substance abuse or self-destructive behavior as a coping mechanism. Um, I think we can all relate to all these as well uh, on some degree or, you know, or, or levels. Um, so the church needs to provide support and healing so we can respond with love and compassion to the impact of abuse. And it, requires accountability for abuses and support for victims. And um, the church can work towards making a safe community and providing policies for safety, encouraging victims to seek support from helplines, shelter or support groups. So now that you've got this, if you know of anyone, please uh, provide that to them. And um, any counseling or maybe legal assistance as well. And um, 
Yes, we just need to educate our communities as well and workplaces about recognizing and responding to domestic violence. So we need to advocate for uh, stronger laws and policies to protect victims and hold abusers accountable. <laughs> We've got a little music here happening. Um, so um, what we need to do as well is to be authentic, to, to, to listen, to provide support and safety. So we need to listen without judgment and allowing survivors to share their stories is, is crucial. Uh, they need warmth, comfort and authentic support for healing. And criticism can be a harsh one, you know, sometimes we don't really know what's going on and suddenly you see them changing or we have a lot of church members as well who just decide to leave and we don't even know why because they don't come to us, they don't, they don't talk to us and we are open to be listening to you. We've got some elders here who are open to listen without criticism without judgment because we are all fallible in this world and we are sinners and we do sometimes horrible things to people um, and this is where Jesus comes in place as well so and speaking out about abuse abuse holding perpetrators accountable and creating a safe community um, is very essential so let's um, just some examples of, um, you know, stories of abuse survivors within the church this, this, one, this time is uh, Jane, who was married to this evangelist who was suffering from physical and sexual and financial abuse in her marriage. And um, she had some duties as well at church. And uh, when she decided to divorce her abuser, um, what they've actually done. So the church failed to support her. They shunned her and blamed her for the abuse, but also, and she felt disconnected and left without feeling that she had a safe church home, unfortunately. And um, so Jack as well, he was groomed and molested by an elder in the church. And what the church did, instead of prioritizing, um, you know, catering for the abuser, uh, the, sorry, the, the one who was being abused, they prioritize forgiveness over the consequences and accountability. So these are the things that we need to uh, put in place and have in mind when we take our decisions in, that, in, in how to handle these situations as well and be responsible and accountable as well. So he felt lost and disconnected in the church and he struggled with anger and pain from the abuse. And there are other experiences that we also encountered here. Um, yesterday, Pastor Daniel was telling me about this lady that he went to visit at the hospital who had a stroke from, um, you know, and, and she was moving from refuge to refuge center, uh, centers, sorry, and she was living with her son who was also affected by the abuse. So, or um, there was another lady as well that, um, I know I went to visit her at the hospital. She had heart surgeries, and, but she was in an abusive uh, situation in, in, in her life. And, um, and you hear the stories, and it's quite horrible. And sometimes you don't really know how to deal with it, but you just, you're just there and listen to their stories and share your testimonies and pray with them. And how they feel about that, they feel, you know, Let me just, so we, we need to take action. So we, we have to go in search of those survivors. We, um, yeah, listening without judgment and showing support and include them maybe in our church events, circles of friends and small groups to demonstrate our care and acceptance. But also, of course, it requires an accountability and abusers must be held accountable for their actions. And these are the things that when we take good care of our, sh of our flock, um, you know, that's what they say. They say it was a, the darkest moment of our lives, but we are encouraged by our community to keep our faith. We felt at ease despite their, uh, the struggle. My pit stop number two 
is more personal this time. So um, what is the power of faith? So let's explore the concept of faith and its role in personal growth and development. Do you think that we can help those who are abused if we don't have a good relationship with God? Um, or if we don't cultivate our relationship with God, I, I think it, it's going to make it more difficult because we have our own challenges and trying to help out other people while we are going through our own challenges can be very difficult, but it can be done when we are with Jesus. But so what does faith mean for us? So, you know, we have to also embrace our personal pain and sacrifice. And God's plan uh, for empowerment includes facing challenges and hardship. So we need to embrace our pain, and it's essential for personal uh, and spiritual growth. But also, what is sacrifices as well so that we can achieve our goals within the will and power of God. So the journey with God may require sacrificing uh, a lot of things, but others are not willing to sacrifice, and the sacrifice sets a person apart. So it will set you apart because you are a child of God, and you will attract like-minded Christians like you. And then when you know pursuing goals with God, not everyone will be able to accompany you either. So, and, and what is belief? But also, sorry, just before I get to the belief part, uh, walking with God, like we need to, disting to distinguish between movement versus progress. Are we progressing? Like we should not confuse it with mere movement or busyness. Or um, it's essential to evaluate if we are truly moving forward and making meaningful improvements. So progress should be driven by God's will and purpose. So remember that um, just by having a good relationship, praying, and um, basically it's just you know reading the Bible and getting to know the Jesus who you're serving and what is He asking of you, you know, and obey. Obedience is a hard one, especially in this kind of world. Um, and also understanding the nature of evil and what is faith in God, you know? Evil is the absence of God, much like darkness is the absence of light. And it manifests where faith, hope, and love, and the gifts that God has given to you are, are lacking, that you're not utilizing them. But also, evil arises from the absence of an all-loving creator. So that's why it's very important that our relationship is very solidified with Jesus. For us to be able to do all these things, not just for ourselves, but for other people. And what is belief? You know, belief is a commitment to God. Um, it, you know, it's more than a super, superficial um, statement. We can't say, oh yeah, I am a Christian, but are you really a Christian if you don't? What is belief? if you're not actually committed to him, you're not committing your life to him. And amidst challenges and sacrifices, because we will always go through trials and tribulation. So professing belief without true commitment does not ensure salvation. Um, and we, how, how do we overcome those trials by finding purpose in suffering? And, and following God's path can be difficult because we all have different challenges. Uh, you know, old, young, uh, children, adults, in, in any kind of ways, rich, poor, we, we all have our challenges that we need to yeah, overcome, basically. So it demands determination to resist distractions and stay true to, his part, to, to our path, to, to, to Jesus' path, sorry. I mean, I have a lot of distractions in my life and I have a, a lot of things that I want to have and, and sometimes I'm being knocked back, you know, several times and I ask myself the question, why uh, are you not um, 
you know, you're not helping me progress to, you know, to help me get things that I want to get, but it's not his will. And then we have to actually just sort of go back into ourselves and ask ourselves the question, what is it that you want from us? Open the Bible and see what he's, he's actually wanting from, from us. But you will find that peace within Jesus. But it's just where is, our, where, where, where is our commitment to him? Is it a true commitment? So enduring trials and maintaining faith in God, it fosters growth and ultimately leads to joy. And we need to focus on um, God's promises and be, be patient. Trusting in God's plan demands patience and, and understanding that he will fulfill his promises in his own time. It is important to be grateful for the present and to seek God's guidance. Believers should embrace trials, recognizing the lessons and uh, growth they provide. Personal struggles and growth can inspire others. Uh, living out one's faith demonstrates God's transformative power. And guiding others through personal experiences and boldly sharing faith is essential. And we have to have humility, you know, and uh, the ability to forgive. Um, and, you know, the ability to forgive is one of the hardest things to do as well. Um, coming, you know, acceptance is probably the hardest thing, and then forgiving as well. But, I mean, Jesus has actually given us an example of forgiveness when he was, you know, put on the cross. And uh, even he had doubts, and he's asked his father, why, you know, have you forsaken me? And then he understood that we just didn't understand anything, and he's asked for forgiveness for us. And I think suffering is probably a pathway to salvation, so we are probably meant to have trials and tribulations because this is where we, we become humble, and then through humility, that's where we start doing some research and understanding and not being, you know, pompous or arrogant about things, but really just researching our own souls and with Jesus and the meaning of life. So let us um, answer Jesus' call to care for the lost. And um, we are believers and we are to seek and care for his lost sheep which includes advocating for abuse victims and offering support. And the church must recognize the, re the reality of abuse and actively work to address it. And we are, I mean, um, Kerry's been very active as well into you know, looking for those refuge centers and asking what, uh, what is needed. And you have participate, participated as well and, and contributed in helping out those uh, people who are in need. And um, so what's actually currently happening is, you know, we've collected the funds, as I say, and we're visiting the sick. So we, we would like to actually visit more of the sick who ha have been affected by domestic violence. And we're delivering the bags today and uh, providing some support and resources as well. And uh, we are talking about potentially having a seminar to be a trauma-informed church. And this is where I come to the end of um, this mini sermon. So, and the greatest of all these is love. And that's the fruit of the Spirit. And, um, you know, love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And cast all your burdens on him, for he cares for you. So if you'd like to stand up and we do a prayer together, please. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this Sabbath day. Thank you for um, your shepherds and your sheep that are here to listen to your word, Jesus. And I would like to ask to bless each and every one of us and to give us the wisdom and guidance of how to fulfill our roles and responsibilities as a church, as church members, as shepherds, 
for your flock, Jesus, for the lost ones, and so that we may also do accordingly to your will, Jesus, for your glory. May you please be each and every, with, with each and every one of us online as well, with our family members, and that you may abide in our hearts, Jesus, and we abide in you as well. Let, let you be our anchor, Jesus, in your glorious name. Amen.